So deep bow to the meditation online sangha. Be in here and then all the YouTube people deep bow to you too. And we're going to read some more of these source verses on the way of abiding. <clears throat> so I'm on page 19. There is no opportunity to escape the ocean of conditioned existence when the flow of virtue and non-virtue is interrupted if there is no union with and then separation from the nature of phenomenon there is immersion in genuine being as the definitive and supreme secret. One effortlessly reaches the primordial level of being Having gained the majestic palace of Dharmakaya, timeless rest. Therefore, all things that are reified by the designation of names and meanings, as well as reactions based on distinctions of better or worse, and deliberate efforts invoking causality, even as all these phenomena manifest, there are ineffable phenomena like space in which nothing need be done. So here Long Chempa is, is again mentioning uh, something that's pretty straightforward and simple, and we don't really need to overthink this, all things that are reified by a designation of names and meanings. That's how we reify things that are impermanent and don't really exist and so and we really invest our mind hearts into that and then set ourselves up for deep suffering from that but once you release that uh, reifying mind a little bit or a lot of it then um, well some answers are coming out of that. That's the meaning of vipassana and dzogchen. All these things that you want answers for, they, the answers will will be there when you release the thinking mind, the labeling. And as long as you're defining things out there, how can the definition be shown to you? When those two things can't happen at once. The decisive experience of ineffability is the ultimate heart essence, since all phenomenon of the world of appearances and possibilities, whether of samsara or nirvana, are ineffable by nature. They are beyond existence. Since the way in which they manifest is unceasing, they are beyond non-existence. See here, the exact point I was making why we can't really define the first Samaya as non-existence because it's, it's always going to be beyond the four extremes, never bound to those four extremes. And here it says beyond existence or non-existence. Since they're neither existent nor non-existent, they're beyond being both. Since there is no such duality, they are beyond being neither. Since they neither are nor are not, the ultimate heart essence cannot be characterized as some thing, for it transcends all imagination and expression. Although the nature of phenomenon is primordially pure, immature people unaware that what is ultimately meaningful has nothing to do with acceptance or rejection, are attached to their own views, and so are continuously imprisoned. How emotionally afflicted they are. Their ideas reify the characteristics of things. See, 
their ideas reify the characteristics of things. Just like I was elaborating a little bit previously. The same, very, very simple here. That you assigning meaning to things is part of the issue, the main issue, you know. Let these things define themselves and then let your thoughts and words come from that, what you see there. How emotionally afflicted they are, their ideas reify the characteristics of things. How confused they are to misconstrue what is ineffable as having identity. How wearisome it is to reify extremes, though none exist. How worthy of compassion are those who wander forever in some sorrow. The sun of ultimate reality, naturally occurring awareness, is obscured by the clouds of both virtue and harm, positive and negative and obstructed by the lightning of obsessive efforts to accept or reject. With the continuous downpour of confused perceptions of happiness and suffering, the seeds of samsara ripen into the crops of the six kinds of being. Alas! How worthy of compassion are beings tormented in the six states? From the consummate and ultimate perspective of the definitive heart essence, chains of gold and ropes are equally binding. Now that's a good quote to remember, Longchenpa said, chains of gold and ropes are equally binding. To give you an idea that we're exiting this good and bad binary value system. And <clears throat> since we have the middle way, uh, we don't behave reckless or become sort of uh, using the Dharma's excuse to do non-virtue. It's not about that. Right? But very important here to, and this comes down to your own experiences too, notice how much we're just trained to say, oh, I shouldn't be feeling like this. I should be feeling some other way. And the truth is, when you accept how you feel, you will feel another way. Paradoxically. So, let's see. Naturally occurring, timeless awareness arises from within the mind. The dark night of causality is cleared away, and the massing clouds of virtue and harm do not amount to anything whatsoever. The sun of ultimate reality shines in the sky of the basic space of phenomena. This is the decisive experience in the ultimate sense. The definitive conclusion is reached by virtue of the ineffable nature of the ten attributes. So those are the ten virtues. This is superior to all spiritual approaches based on either causes or results. Non-manifest meditative absorption is beyond the range of meditation. The self-knowing awareness as such, free of elaboration, is the decisive experience of the complete resolution of phenomenon. Phenomenon are resolved in it. Moreover, finds its resolution in phenomenon. So this is another um, helpful thing to use that Longchipa says mind is resolved in phenomenon, phenomenon is resolved in mind. And if you don't know what that means, keep it as a koan, sort of. But here again, phenomenon are resolved in it. Moreover, finds its resolution in phenomenon. Because it's phenomenon itself that you're attached to and reifying. So once that stops, phenomenon shows you your mind. Also the importance of togya. 
Since this decisive experience has nothing to do with whether or not there is such resolution, it is decidedly beyond characterization and expressions in terms of existence or non-existence. See why at this point it would be really silly to use non-existence as a definition for the first Samaya. I would all of the, these all these parts would make no sense if we did that. There's no specific reference point, but rather a supremely spacious and panoramic state. Phenomenon are resolved. Ordinary consciousness is transcended. How joyful is one immersed in genuine being. This very state, immersion in genuine being, in the past, present, and future, is the single basic space of enlightened intent. The uninterrupted nature of phenomenon. Masters of awareness share a dimension of experience equal to that of all victorious ones. The non composite expanse, unchanging and indivisible. The expanse of naturally occurring timeless awareness beyond effort and achievement. The expanse in which all phenomenon are mere names beyond imagination and expression. Within this wholly positive realm in which nothing need be done, regardless of what manifests, there is still wholly positive basic space. In this basic space of Samantabhadra, the all good, apparent phenomenon and emptiness are not better or worse. When the ineffable is taken as existent, labeling occurs out of confusion. Yet even while there is labeling, there is no confusion or its opposite. See, again, pretty much the main issue for our, our problems, our confusion, whatever, is the labeling. Very That's great news for a yogi. You know, it really simplifies this whole equation of what's going on with the mind and uh, what to do about it or, or why it's happening, all this stuff, you know, really answers a lot of questions. And now if you, if you haven't seen that already, it's time to investigate. Look, look at your mind when it does that labeling and what are the results of that labeling? Without awareness, you would have never seen that. You'd be caught up in the labeling, <laughs> right? And whenever we're, we feel like we have to change something about ourselves. We're actually reifying duality there. We're saying, oh man, I had this anxiety. What can I do to get rid of it? There's so many dualities in there and divisions being reified um, and labels being applied, right? We can see that now. So thus concerning the phenomenon of the world of appearances and possibilities, whether of samsara or nirvana, with the decision that there is no question of there being confusion or not, nirvana is not something to be achieved by renouncing samsara. See again, you don't. We're not renouncing, you know, our anxiety, our anger, our desire, our pride, our jealousy. We're not renouncing those. It's very important to just be like a phone that when you turn it to look at yourself, it's naked lookingness. And that's how awareness is. Your whole experience is within that. And those four foundations of mindfulness, right? The body, the emotions, the emotional energy, uh, the thoughts, whether coarse or subtle, and the environment, you know, all these sense uh, stimuli. But this includes perhaps our, our aura, you know, the energy we sort of feel outside of our body. And so that turns into the environment and the whole thing, we can start to see how it's all within our awareness, just like the whole environment and our bodies all within space. Just like that. Yeah. So we don't need to renounce our pride, our jealousy, etc. And you'll start to be able to see the true nature of that pride, of that jealousy, etc. With the decision that there is no question of things being born or not, one transcends objects conceived of as being born or ceasing, as existent or not. 
with the decision that there is no question of whether there is purity or impurity, there is equilibrium, nothing better or worse, no acceptance or rejection. See, it's great to see that word equilibrium here in this text. I've used that word, and I wasn't sure about myself saying that word, uh, whether that was appropriate or not. So it's really great to hear it in this text. Uh, so that can go in line with evenness. There's an equilibrium because, you know, we're always in this sort of pure land, this enlightenment. But our mind takes us out of it. So as we rest, we, we release. We release all the doing and labeling and all that stuff. And we release the div divisive thinking so that we rest into oneness, open-heartedness. And just effortlessly resting here. Whatever comes up, it's fine. If I feel awkward, if I feel prideful, it's all, I'm the first to see it. Yeah. And you start, start to come into your natural state. Your thoughts, your subtle thoughts, your heart, your emotions, your subtle emotions, your body, your energy, the environment, all starts to come into a sort of tukka, <laughs> a harmony sort of. So. One has come to the decisive experience of all phenomena within the holy positive expanse. From the precious treasury of the way of abiding, this is the first topic, reaching the definitive conclusion concerning the utter inexpressibility of all phenomena. Okay, so we got through the first, first out of the four already. Any uh, comments, questions? Everybody good, yeah? I hope so. Well, I hope my explanations were of some use and you're able to get some benefit out of that text. <laughs> Those are a lot of thumbs. <laughs> you don't have that many hands. Okay, so we're going to do uh, 161 for uh, the benefit of all the heart mentions today, and then um, also the pacification of these wars and aggression in the world and the corruption and abuse, just sort of um, across all six realms. We'll do this Avloki Deshwar of the six realms, okay? Uh, We'll start off with the um, refuge in Bodhicitta from page 171 and skip over to 161, okay? So remember, when we do the Namo Konchok Sumdan Sawasam, refuge in Bodhicitta, you're sort of taking refuge in your awareness. And then ultimately, this is a Avalokita of the six realms is a Dzogchen Sadhana. For example... It says, the realm of the great compassionate one, which is your mind, is the non-duality of good and bad. Can you believe that? Exactly what we just read in <laughs> Long Chimpo, isn't it? Exactly what we were just discussing. I'm going to stop mentioning when there's themes going on, but there's a theme going on. <laughs> so that's, that's really amazing, just turn to this is Avalokiteshvara of the six realms and I'm just reading the, the translation which really uh, I see these as mantras are sort of the Sambhokakaya language it's like the bridging the gap between the thinking mind the conceptual mind the thoughts so you hear these translations those are more Nirmanakaya to me 
And the mantra itself is more Sambhokakaya, like a little bit reaching that ineffability through the mantra, like Om. It doesn't have like a straight definition that you can apply to it. And so it's sort of working with your ineffable, ineffable sort of uh, awareness, you know, your your pure consciousness. So um, it says here, the realm of the great compassionate one is the non-duality of good and bad. Non-existence itself appears like an illusion. Appearance itself is pure, free of fixation. In that state, attachment and aversion are self-liberated. This is the pure, all-encompassing realm. I prostrate and render praise to the realm of the great compassionate one. The enlightened body of the great compassionate one is the non-duality of appearance and emptiness, empty yet appearing, like a reflection of the moon and water, appearing yet empty, its nature vast like an ocean. In this state, emptiness and appearance are self-liberated. This is pure, all-encompassing enlightened body. I prostrate and render praise to the enlightened body of the great compassionate one. And so when it says Tuji Chimpo, Tuji means compassion, which is also uh, the word when you look up she, it's it's the display of your mind is called Tuji, the compassionate display. Chimpo is great, like Zokchen, and then Ku is body. So Tuji Chimpo Kula Chaksalo is praising. So Tuji Chimpo Kula Chaksalo is. Um, Rendering praise to your uh, great compassionate body. And like that, we have body, speech, and mind. So the next one is going to be speech, right? So the enlightened speech of the great compassionate one is resounding, empty, and beyond expression. Empty, yet resounding, like an echo. Resounding, yet empty. Its nature, inexpressible. In that state, Resonance and emptiness are self-liberated. This is pure, all-encompassing, enlightened speech. I prostrate and render praise to the enlightened speech of the great compassionate one. So, really great that, that this is word-for-word word Dzogchen, and there's no deviation from what we were just reading by Long Chimpa. Really great. So free, the enlightened mind of the great compassionate one, so it went body, speech, now mind, is luminous, empty, and free of grasping. Empty, yet luminous, like the colors of a rainbow. Luminous, yet empty, its nature like space. In this state, luminosity and emptiness are self-liberated. This is all-encompassing enlightened mind. I prostrate and render praise to the enlightened mind of the great compassionate one. So Tiji Jimpo again, the great compassionate. Um, Tug is uh, mind. So Tug La Chaksa Lo. And then the last one really talks about going beyond uh, good and bad here. It says the molten lava ground is the realm of the great compassionate one. Ox-headed Shinji, that's basically an old term for, um, like, the more demonic-type energies, maybe we could call them, um, like the devil, like the most demonic stuff, is, and it says, the ox-headed Shinji is the enlightened body of the great compassion one, even that stuff, and it says, kill, kill, strike, strike, is the sound of the six syllables, the arrow, spear, and sword, and we can add guns, tanks, missiles, drones, robots, right? Our diverse offering substances. Happiness and suffering, self-liberated, are this pure, all-encompassing expanse. I prostrate and render praise to all existence, which is the great compassionate one. So Nangsid, there is all existence to Jijimpo La Chaksalu. Okay. I've gone over the first part of it. So that's uh, the first part of it is basically the six realms, you know, the animals, the people, uh, 
the ghost realms, the hell realms, the, the gods, the demigods. You can see this as people that are actually here living sort of lives like that, you know. Um, so we basically place the Avalokiteshvara in each of those realms and um, to benefit, basically trying to cover everywhere with compassion, okay? Any questions about the Avalokiteshvara sadhana? Okay, very good. Namo Konjo Sum Dan Sawasum Kabne Namla Kapsu Chin Dogon Sange Lago Chin Janjo Chodu Zamkendu. Namo Konjo Sunda Sawa Sum Kabne Namla Kapsu Chi Dogo Sange Lago Chi Janjo Chodu Zamkendu Namo Koncho Sum Da Sawa Sum Kabne Nam La Kyap Su Chi Dogon Sange La Gu Chi Jan Chu Chu Du Zem Khen Du Ranye Te Ji Jem Po Ne Ka Po Ta Shi Ta Shi Pa Ta Da Te Wa Pe Ma Tin Pyo Do Rat Na Ta Ge Kin Pema da we din la shu Om mani pema o la yi jin din wandu par Chaji chaji ta jadam Piwa pema da we din Kimu dugi shu parsam Om om so ha Lamin jin din wandu kang Chaji chaji ta jadam Goso pema da we din Kimu drugi shupar sam Umma so ha Me jin din mandukka Chaji chaji ta jadam Chewa pema da we din Kimu drugi shupar sam Umni so ha Jashi Jashi Ta Jardong Bodhi Pema Da Waiting Yomo Rukhi Shubharsam Om Phe Soha Ye Daag Jing Din Munduk Mar Jashi Jashi Ta Jardong Do Pema Da Waiting Yomo Rukhi Shubharsam Om Me Soha Nyawe jindin mwanjuk nag Chashi chashi ta jardong Mecho pema chagnatin Kyumo drugi shuparsam Om hum soha Didar tuji jimpo duggi Towa dunka dawe din hila Yingi chuggi kowa ko Duggi tukkor om sogye Drobrebe la ye chuggi kowa Jur Om ma ho Om ma ni pe me ho Zanyi ni me duji jimpo shi Me shi na wa ki ma ta po lo Na shi na ba shi na zim me pe na Om Mahore, Om 
Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I really appreciate you. Okay, any uh, final thoughts today before we go? Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, too. I really hope you all get a good rest and everything and have a good night. And maybe see you in the next session, okay? Please take care. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.